If you've been told to pull up your socks recently, then make sure it's a pair of RCR socks. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash shop. It's that time of the show again. It's Olivia's View, and with me now is Olivia Pearson. How are you, Olivia? I'm great, thanks, Ken. How are you? How are you? I'm always, you know, box of fluffies, always. But you know my role on that. Yeah, yep. always answer in the affirmative because no one actually cares if you shit. <laughs> so true. <laughs> <laughs> what have you got for me today? Well, I'm following on, Cam, with academic freedom because this has been a absolute storm in um, Britain over the last five years, and I'll describe what happened um, over there because they got a great win and then they it, it all got lost, but I'll describe what happened. There has been a monumental fight going on in England over the last few years regarding freedom of speech on university campuses. After so many controversial speakers being deplatformed and presti- at prestigious universities like Cambridge and Oxford, you might remember that Jordan Peterson was banned from Cambridge by the perennial umbrage mob in 2019. Well, after student societies at Oxford University deplatformed the history professor Selena Todd and a former Home Secretary Amber Rudd in 2020, the Secretary of State for Education at that time, Gavin Williamson, warned that the government would move to defend free speech if universities failed to do so themselves. Universities did fail. And a new bill was introduced titled the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act, which Her Majesty Elizabeth II announced in her speech from the throne for the opening of Parliament in May 2021, when Boris Johnson was still Prime Minister. Then the bill became a ferocious storm as amendments were sought and woke lobby groups were outraged and wording was quibbled over by the once noble House of Lords which brings to mind a scene from that acclaimed movie about manly integrity, A Man for All Seasons, where Thomas More shouts at Lord Norfolk, the nobility of England would have snored through the Sermon on the Mount, but you'll labour like scholars over a bulldog's pedigree. Anyway, after the legislation was announced by the Queen, UK university student unions wondered out loud whether rabid Holocaust deniers or so-called Islamophobes would now be welcomed onto their campuses as speakers and actually be able to speak. They had become so used to successfully deplatforming people with speech they found repugnant, including people such as philosophy professor Dr. Kathleen Stock, who was forced to resign from Sussex University because of her unpopular views on natural biological sex, which the troons and trans activists considered to be evil heresy in their shitty little book of woke. The bill insisted on a statutory tort, Clause 4, which protected the right to sue the universities for breaching any individual's freedom of speech, both students and faculty members. Universities, colleges, and student unions in England would now have a legal duty to promote freedom of speech or be hit financially if they did not. The term respect, as in respect a person's religious beliefs, was amended to tolerate the beliefs and opinions of others. The upshot of all this was that the previous Conservative government managed to get through the legislation and the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act 2023 was given royal assent by King Charles III. <clears throat> I'm sure His Majesty must have done that through his famously gritted teeth. The Act required universities to robustly promote and protect freedom of speech on their respective campuses through a code of practice. But interestingly, Cambridge University wrote up their code of practice in a much different manner than did Oxford University. The Committee for Academic Freedom, the CAF, wrote this all up in detail and used Cambridge University as the ultimate exemplar for all colleges and higher education to follow. Quote, the University of Cambridge has developed a strong new code of practice It refers in detail and accurately to the main legislation governing freedom of speech. It states unambiguously that protecting freedom of speech ensures that staff and students 
may be exposed to research, course material, discussion, or speakers' views that they find offensive, contentious, or unacceptable, but are nonetheless within the law. Unquote. In contrast to Cambridge University's Code of Practice, the CAF cites the differing Oxford University Code of Practice, in particular on five points, the first and main one being the Oxford Code states that as an integral part of our commitment to freedom of expression, we will take steps to ensure that all exchanges of views happen respectfully. Academic freedom requires tolerance, not respect. Indeed, it requires the ability to say civilly that one does not respect a person's work or ideas. Respect implies a positive esteem whose absence toleration permits. Enforced respect is intolerance. The CAF believes that the University of Oxford's Code of Practice on Freedom of Speech is an instructive example for other universities of what not to do. So the great University of Cambridge came out as a true bastion of freedom of speech, welcoming this legislation to promote freedom of expression on campuses in England and about high time too. But, alas, as soon as Keir Stalin Starmer became Prime Minister, this important act was all made moot. The legislation, even though it received royal assent due to roll out fully on August the 1st of this year, was swiftly shelved by the new Labour government. I repeat, the entire act has been completely abandoned, even though it became law. In fact, the new Education Secretary, Bridget Phillipson, said she will now consider repealing it. Arif Ahmed, a former Cambridge professor and the first ever appointed government free speech czar and a libertarian committed to academic free speech, had spent a whole year designing a new complaint scheme because of the act, which would have allowed visiting speakers to lodge appeals if they were no platformed. Cambridge University's new code of conduct will ensure visiting speakers are allowed to express controversial or unpopular views within the law and that protest must not shut down debate. The powerful Russell Group conglomeration even said it would consider covering security costs for any controversial speakers in any of their 24 associated universities, including Cambridge and Oxford. But now... Cambridge said other elements of its free speech plans had been paused pending further clarity following the Education Secretary's decision to halt the new legislation. In other words, they're watching what is happening to British protesters and social media users with the arrests and imprisonings that are intended to be an example and send a message that free speech will not be tolerated in Stalin Starmer's Britain and Cambridge University now doesn't know what to do next. So that's the backdrop of the fight for academic freedom in the UK over the last five years and throughout the COVID era. It was a total win for free speech with the new legislation, then a sudden total loss due to the new Labour government. And in New Zealand, according to Dr James Kirstead, author of the report Unpopular Opinions, Academic Freedom in New Zealand, With the New Zealand Initiative Think Tank, whom you've just heard interviewed with Cam, Dr. Keirstead wrote, the report is, quote, a thoroughly documented examination of the state of academic freedom at our universities, together with an analysis of the main threats to academic freedom in this country at present, unquote. The report states four main threats to our academic freedom. Liberal progressives the CCP, the Treaty of Waitangi, and sex and gender. We all know the Troons are abominable on this front regarding the thugs' veto and what it and they have brought to culture. Mega disgusting grossness from A to Z. I'm sick of even hearing about it. So unlike what Britain has gone through before Stalin Starmer ruined it, with no legislation to address freedom of speech properly 
in academia or anywhere else, the New Zealand Institute think tank have left any idea about new legislation up to the Free Speech Union to consider. Does New Zealand need new legislation like Britain embarked upon in order to actively promote and protect free speech in our universities? I think it may. And that is Olivia's view for The Crunch this week. You know, Olivia, I think you're right there that we do need to have the government pick this up and force the universities to have some sort of free speech czar that looks at academic freedom and all that. Because in my monologue earlier in the show, I said that academic freedom is closely related with free speech, that if they come for academic freedom, eventually they come for free speech and then they come for all your others. And that academic freedom is, in fact, the canary in the coal mine and the poor little canaries lying on the bottom of the cage, feet up, gasping for breath at the moment. Mm, yep, you're right. If it goes in the universities completely, as it has done. And, I mean, what's all this nonsense about the CCP being so effective? I mean, I believe the report. I believe that that's the thing. It's, it's dead right. The CCP, uh, you know, Anne-Marie Brady was, has been con consistently victimised by mm. the CCP operatives and, you know, remember the National Party had um, Jiang Yang as a, as an MP who was you know who trained spies in a military uh, university. Um, yeah. So they are into uh, politics. They're into the universities because the Chinese, you know, we 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 can deride them all they like, but you know they've got a thousand year plan. We've mm. got a three year plan. They have a thousand year plan, and part of that thousand year plan is to infect universities with their ideology so that they end up with a whole bunch of people who are civil servants and key business people who subscribe to the to to their ideology. And yeah. that's not something that we should be liking. We shouldn't be like Don Brash and Helen Clark and John Key cuddling up to the Chinese. We should be saying, this is our country, you play by our rules, or you can leave. Yeah, that's right. I noticed that the recommendation was to divest and um uh, or review CCP linked programs in the report. And I think that's a really good idea. But uh, why has it become so hard for us to tell other countries where to get off? Well, they tell they... us what to do. So, you know, mm, so. Yeah. And, and, but again, like the report, though, was a little bit soft on that, saying, well, we need to, everything that comes from China is linked to the CCP. Yeah. You need to remember that, right? It doesn't matter. That might be a military university. With the, associated to the PLA, but that university there, the top people in that university are senior CCP people. Mm. So the university is, any university is controlled and operated for the benefit of the CCP. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no, they don't have free enterprise in the same sense that we do. So um, they don't have free anything. Free enterprise either. We've got a managed enterprise where politicians meddle on things and. Yeah, you know, true. Try, try to regulate it every every step of the way. So, right. well, thank you for for your view. And um, you're welcome, Cam. We'll we'll be back with another Olivia's view soon. Okay, great. Thanks. See ya. Thanks for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. Do you like what you're listening to, or dislike what you're listening to? Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We'd love to hear from you, so connect with us today.